morning then. It's very nice of you to turn out so early and listen to a bit, well, let's not call it history, let's call it anecdotes about games, how they came to be what we know about them now and um, how they were distributed and where they originated from. As you probably all know with from games as familiar as Ludo or chess or all those friends like checkers, they have been around for centuries and they have usually either accompanied soldiers across the boundaries or they have been used to educate children. Uh, the best example for this is the ancient goose game where you had in the 36 or 54 uh, spots um, religious or other contents that should be um, taught to the children. Um, the 20th century, early 20th century, around 1910-1914, saw the first two big major changes in board games. First, they became, due to different productions and materials, um, available for a far bigger range of population. And doesn't it work? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So here we are back to the to the goose game. This is one of those examples. Uh, they exist in many different uh, forms. Uh, mass market production uh, games for the first time uh, were available to a bigger range of population, and also people began to have the time to play board games in, let's put it, part of the population that in earlier times didn't have access to them or didn't have time to play them. The real first widespread distribution was done for this game. Uh, it was invented, uh, invented um, as I said, at the beginning of the 20th century. The company itself today puts it at 1914, so they will be celebrating 100 years of that game next year. And uh, they produced it in what at that time was an enormous amount of 3,000 copies and sent them to field hospitals for soldiers in First World War. So that's how the game became famous. It got uh, word of mouth propaganda and people said it's fun to play. And so this was the first time that um, a board game had a wide distribution range. And believe it or not, they sold a million copies till 1920. Um, about that time in the United States, uh, a woman called Maggie Phillips, she developed a game because she was a prop propagator or a, uh, somebody who wanted the single tax system introduced. And so she tried to do that by proposing a game called the Landlord's Game, which you have probably all heard of. It turned later on in Monopoly. Interestingly enough, there were other games at that time. One was called Finance and Fortune. And um, they all are assigned to different people until there came somebody called Charles Darrow, who is by now the inventor who is always cited. He is always called the designer of the game. What he really did is to put together the different versions of the Landlord's Game and the Finance and Fortune Game and turned it into what we now know as Monopoly. So you could call him the editor or the first developer. A little historical sideline on Monopoly. My home country, Austria, is the only country where an officially approved version of Monopoly exists under another name. This is due to historical developments um, prior to um, Austria being what it is today. We were, of course, part of the Third Reich, as you know. And um, Monopoly was in Austria at time, that time under license to that little company that is mentioned here called Stormo. And they had to change the name because Monopoly was too 
much Anglo-Saxon for the liking of the authorities of the day. And after the Second World War, Parker Brothers simply forgot to rescind the license. So Stormer, who was in business till the 70s, just retained the license from before the war, and so they could, could and can still propose and produce this game. The license has changed hands a few times and is now with Piatnik, who is a 175-year-old company in Austria and famous worldwide for its playing cards. So, this was Monopoly, and it is still around today. Another line of games that got big due to the World War are the propaganda games. They were to support or to explain war efforts. Here you have an example of a card game based on the mechanisms of happy families. Uh, they um, were meant to teach people either how to save energy or not to steal coal or whatever was the tame theme that the authorities wanted to get across. Um, Mechanisms-wise, those games were usually based on those familiar mechanisms, snake and ladders, or sometimes even chess, but nothing really inventive in the way of mechanisms. Uh, those new mechanisms were happening, interestingly enough, in the what we would, in a generic term, call America. Here you have another propaganda example, and this you all know. It also originates in America in the 50s. It was called crisscross. Uh, the name Scrabble came quite a time later. Another example for what everybody nowadays thinks of a typically American board game, surprisingly isn't an American design. It went across the Atlantic from France in the 50s. It's called Risk. The designer is called Lamoris, and it was first published in France. So this has kind of taken us to the time after the Second World War. There were still in Germany and uh, England and America, individual small companies or big toy companies who designed some games. This is a German example rather early with what later on became the familiar brand of Schmidtspiele. In America, another thing sprang up in the wakes of World War II, that was conflict simulation games. You are probably familiar with that term. It's simulations of real and uh, imaginary battles, where you have uh, always the same kind of components, a huge map made up of hexagons and lots of little cardboard counters, and uh, you simulate the terrain and the army units simply by uh, those markers and move them to the rules. It might be interesting to mention that um, cousin players always tell you that there are some cousins where you can do whatever you want, the battle will end the way it historically ended, and that there are other battles which you can quite easily turn around, so somebody must have done something badly wrong to make it end like it did. Uh, from the battlefield to the conference table, that was diplomacy. It uh, was designed by somebody called Alan Kalhammer in 1954, and like many of those games in those times, he first published it himself in a very small print run, and then it got picked up by Barker and Avalon Hill. Um, Diplomacy is a game of military conflict. It's set in the times uh, around World War I. You have the big powers of that time. And you move your troops, but the main part of the game is just negotiation with the explicit purpose of not keeping what you negotiated. You can turn around and do something that you didn't tell you would do and then convince 
that power in the next round that it was an accident or whatever. So you can really um, cheat and uh, break your word. Um, this game, interestingly enough, was the first game worldwide that got played by mail. It was, there were far more communities playing diplomacy by mail, especially in student circles, and this is also the way it came to Europe first. Besides the Parker Company who did the board games at that time in the United States, we had Milton Bradley. They mainly did children's games, uh, usually educational ones. You see there were many versions of diplomacy. Milton Bradley, fun games, component games, and uh, you wouldn't believe it, even Hasbro, the main player in that field today, was around somewhere in the background. They had something that was called an ice creamer. Uh, Parker, as you could see briefly, was um, doing Clue at that time already. So we really have a big kind of blossoming of um, board games in the 50s in the United States, not so in Europe. This is another early example of the Wall Street game, which you can see was even at that time um, kind of associated with the media, with NBC Entertainment. And then something interesting happened. Um, another company began to make board games that is nowadays known for many, many other things. Probably everybody knows about uh, the Scotch um, sellotape, which is done by 3M, the Minnesota Mining and Manufacturing Company. And there aren't many now who know that they started to produce board games in the 60s in America. And what was so fascinating and what kept them kind of in the view of collectors and players alike was the fact that they had assembled an anonymous group of game designers where later in the 70s and early 80s, uh, we found out that they were quite famous. It was, for instance, Alex Randolph, whom you will all know for his uh, Twixt. This was Sid Saxon's Bazaar, um, the Acquire. Here is Alex Randolph's Twixt. So they really did the games that we nowadays would call the classic early uh, board games. Um, they also had a smaller range of games. Uh, Venture is another Sid Saxon design, Monard. And they published them in very, very many versions and colors and God knows what. So this was um, in the 80s a huge um, topic for collectors who tried to get all the color variation and box sizes and whatnot. Funnily enough, there is a nice story to tell about one of those games, which is Yati. For quite some time, there was a rumor that this game existed. Nobody had seen it. And then it turned out that um, the company at that time was aware that people began to talk and write about games. And so they sent the game to a few people they thought who might tr like to try it before they printed it. And everybody gave it such a thumbs down that it never got really printed. So today, after everybody went hunting for Yati, I remember a copy being auctioned off at Essen for what then was 6,000 Deutschmarks, which would today be 3,000 euros, uh, for one game that allegedly wasn't very good. And nowadays, we already know about 58 copies. So probably all these people are kind of um, passed away now, and somebody's clearing out the attics where they have been sitting till today. So. That was Yati. And this company was the one that got board games uh, in, the, in that way to Europe, back to Europe again, because 3M had a branch in Germany and they started producing German editions of the American games. 
and that's how the idea of board games came to German. What I mean by that is a certain kind of board games. At that time, in America, the board games had not only picked up um, production-wise, they looked much nicer, had nicer components, but what's very important, they had topics, they had themes. In earlier days, you had more or less abstract pieces moving about, and um, this changed with those games. If you now wonder why I have a label that's clearly not a game, this was a cigarette brand. And this was something totally unexpected that happened in Germany in the early 70s. This cigarette... Okay, I'll try, but it's hard for me to sit. Yeah, I think it might even be easier if I use this. Is that much better? Yeah, okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Um, as I said, this was a cigarette brand, and the producing company got into a cooperation with two board game producing companies in Germany, Schmidt and Us, and they founded gaming clubs all over Germany, propagating their cigarettes and games. And there's quite a big range of altogether about 30 games produced under that label. Those with the colored markings here, they were done by Schmidtspiele. And um, as you see, the Germans at that point were still a bit into abstract games. Uh, it was not so much topics, they slowly came, but some of them were still more or less uh, mathematically or abstractly based games. Uh, some of those gaming groups still exist today. One of the most famous and the oldest one is Spürotzen in Munich, still headed by Mr. Weigand, who started the first club there way back in the 70s. Um, 1974 takes us back across to America again, where somebody called Gary Gigax uh, wrote the first chapters of that never-ending story that is still going strong today. It was Dungeons and Dragons. It was um, at the shores of Lake Geneva, where he lived and where he started producing those things in what was the company um, TSR. And uh, I don't know, you probably all are familiar with Chencon. Chencon started out as a fan meeting of Dungeon and Dragon players at Gary Gigax's place, and then at the company in TSR, and then it grew and mushroomed and grew bigger. And then TSR took Dungeons and Dragons and the convention to Milwaukee, where it slowly expanded into uh, board games and other branches. And so we are happy to have Jenkins still today, despite uh, Dungeons and Dragons and the ownership uh, having passed into the Hasbro hands um, under the name of Wizards of the Coast. There was actually a German equivalent that came quite soon to uh, Dungeons and Dragons. It's called Das Schwarze Auge and is also still in the market in its third or fourth edition. And by the way, Dungeons and Dragons is heading for a fifth edition of the rules now. Funnily enough, for 20 years, there was roughly a 10 year rhythm from those. Uh, 74 um, invention of Dungeons and Dragons, that in America, new game systems evolved. In the early 80s, it was Trivial Pursuit, who set the basis for all the trivia games, which unfortunately then tended to kind of push out of the market the other kinds of game in America. When you, in the 90s, stood in the front of a wall at, at um, Toys R Us in America, you had trivia games on every single tiny game show or whatever, and 
frankly, not much else besides uh, the Milton Bradley children games. Again, about 10 years later, in 1994, there was somebody called Richard Garfield, and he came up with magic. I'm showing you here the probably most famous single item in all the Magic the Gathering uh, editions. This is the famous Arabian Night Booster, which contained that one single famous card that everybody coveted, I think. This thing in our collection might be one of the very few left that are unopened. I beg your pardon? Unopened. Yeah, I said unopened, and <laughs> still there as it was. Um, well, this of course spread worldwide and uh, was something that uh, started really the international distribution of, of games um, in the wake of Monopoly. In between there wasn't much that really crossed all the borders uh, with the exception of maybe risk. So again, it was more or less uh, migration from America across the Atlantic to other countries in Europe. Um, besides the major players in the game, uh, Parker, Milton Bradley, who were then all uh, swallowed up by Hasbro, there was Avalon Hill, who was um, famous for more complicated games, more um, sophisticated games. Um, I show this here because uh, we had... Uh, small companies in Europe at that time springing up and also in the United States, self-publishers, um, people who tried to bring more complicated things. You probably all know Ellen Moon, the designer of um, the White Wind games. He um, published the games under the brand. How can I get back? Can I, can I go back to the... The pictures here seem to be in the wrong. I'm sorry. I think it's a page up and a page down. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. OK. So, um, no, something is. I'm sorry there is one picture missing. Maybe it's coming later. OK, I'll just go on. Um, Alan Moon, who was the designer of, of Ticket to Ride that you are probably knowing, he had his own company in the early 90s. And in that company, he published Elfen Roads, the game that later went on to become Game of the Year in, in Germany, published by Amigo. Um, in England, Francis Tresham um, came up with 1829 already in the 70s. Uh, this was the springboard and the root of the whole family of games that's nowadays called 18xx and um, it really took off when Avalon Hill in America picked it up and published this kind of a sequel 1830. Uh, Francis Tresham for me is one uh, genius of a game designer that there are many of them uh, around now um, he gave us not only that marvelous concept of railway games, which are an interesting mixture of track building and uh, stock trading, he also gave us Civilization, the board game, which, from what I know and, and could find out, was the first game that transferred back and fro from the board to the computer and back and back to the computer. You all are familiar with Sid Meier's Civilization, which is definitely a spin-off of this game via the computer games. Back to our side, um, nothing much happened uh, in, in new companies or game concepts, but Due to those corner clubs I mentioned and th due to uh, Parker Brothers coming into Germany and doing German editions of games that were uh, doing well in America, the consciousness of games in, in Germany uh, kind of picked up and as the Germans are always a very thorough people, they started doing reviews 
in a bigger scale. They started mentioning games in newspapers and other media, and this led to what is now known Game of the Year. A group of, of game critics, of, of game reviewers, got together and decided to put out an award. Interestingly enough, and illustrating what I said, that at that time, kind of the root of board gaming was still in the Anglo-Saxon um, culture. The first game of the year they picked was a game by an English designer called David Parlett. It was awarded the prize in 1979, and it had been published sometime earlier by a company called Intellect Games in England under the name of Hare and Tortoise. The next game of the year in the 80s was, um, in 1980, was Rummy Cup, which was a game that originated in um, an Eastern country in Romania and then was transferred to Israel by its inventor. And also Dumfries, another game of the year, was an English designer. So in that time, we have lots of Anglo-Saxon influence still there. These times also saw the beginning of recognition for the game designers. This was the time when people started digging around because the 3M games were about and uh, being played. They wanted to find out who was behind those games. And one of the designers himself, Alex Randolph, who's I think probably the most widely known, he was very insistent that games should be showing on the box or at least on the rules the name of the game designer because he equaled a, des a game designer with a book author. Now, in Germany, again, we have small companies doing quite fancy things. This is one of the more famous ones for his individual designs. It's Reinhard Wittig with Edition Perlhuhn. And what you see here is something called Wikinger Schach. It was a redesign of an ancient game called Nefertafel, which actually originates from Scandinavia and is thought to be centuries old. Um, anybody know Carcassonne here? Okay, well, that is Hans im Glück, and they have been multiple winners game of the year. Back in the 70s, Hans im Glück was a garage company. It was one of those many small companies that sprang up around that time. When You see, when game of the year came, suddenly everybody started talking about games. They were lucky enough to get the support of the um, Minister for Families, and uh, so it got popularity, and um, so lots of people thought they could maybe publish their own designs. And so did Bernd Bonhoeffer and Karl-Heinz Schmiel, and they started with Hans im Glück in a garage, and this is their first game, Dodge City. And um, there were Brüterhorn games, there were companies that were going strong for some time, like Effix Schmidt, they put out quite a good range of games, had game of the year, and then slowly petered out. There were other companies like Schmidt, who also went bankrupt, but at least was lucky enough to got their name saved and, and the brand going on. Um, as I said, at that time, it really started to explode. And another factor that uh, really assisted in that development was um, game of the year, great game of the year, of course, but also Spiel at Essen. Spiel at Essen started in 1983, and they were, I think, at the first day they had about 3,000 people the first time. And now it's 150,000 in in four days, and it is really the mecca of board gaming and uh, of uh, designers meeting there of. Uh, playtesting of people buying rare games, home-produced games, it really has turned into the center of, of games play. And of course, giving the, all those small companies the chance to, to show their games there and even to sell them helped 
these kind of uh, games to be produced, and there were countless small companies that uh, I really couldn't bother uh, you with to, to all uh, talk about them. Um, quietly doing his work at that time was the one person beside uh, Francis Tresham that I really would call a genius as board game designer. Of course, I'm talking of Klaus Däuber. Um, he gave us quite a number of original designs. One of them, the, his first game uh, to earn Game of the Year was Barbarossa. Interestingly enough, it was the first creative game, and I think the only one that ever got the prize. You, I don't know if you are familiar with the game. You have um, lumps of Play-Doh that you have to shape into images that are not too clear because you don't want everybody to guess it, but they need, can't be too obtuse because if nobody guesses it, it's bad for you too. The optimum is if two or three of the maximum of six players guess what you have been doing. Um, his second game, of course, later, that we all know is Settlers of Catan. But in between, he had two other games of the year, so you see he was really quite a good designer. One was Adel Verpflichtet, and the other one was Drunter und Drüber, which was Hans im Glück's first game of the year. And the, so we have arrived at Settlers. Settlers probably is the turning point for what we now call the Euro style or the German type board game. If you think back to your childhood, you have probably all played Monopoly or those other games. And all those games previously to Settlers usually had one factor in common. They were what I would call linear games. It was your turn and everybody else on the table just watched. And usually you couldn't do much before it was your turn again because Either there wasn't much to do or the situation changed and you could start thinking when it was your turn. With Settlers, Klaus Teuber changed this. Settlers really was the first board game that due to that resource, resource dice that um, gave resources to everybody and with the trading part of each turn involved all the players on the table. So you really were playing all the time and playing interactively. And that really and definitely changed the design of board games that came afterwards. So, and also for me, Settlers is, is something that I always say a good board game has. If you play it well, and then it's your ingenuity. And if you lose, well, then it was the dice. It's really that kind of mixture that is a good game and that has influenced, he really did influence game design massively with, with that Settlers game. Um, nowadays, we are talking a lot of mechanisms in board games like resource management or worker placement games. Um, Kylos is supposed to be the one that started that worker placement um, mechanism meaning that you put um, markers on the board uh, to decide on actions that you want to do later in your turn. Agricola, of course, is another one. This is currently the game that is getting most prizes and most awards and is played in tournaments and worldwide. And now we are kind of seeing the tide going the other way. Um, all those games from Settlers onwards have been migrating to the United States and all over the world. Um, they were brought to America by people like um, Jay Tomlinson, who uh, with his Rio Grande games got uh, the Euro games going in America. They were really talking about uh, German board games there. And now he brought us back something, uh, yet another new concept, the concept of deck building games. And that's again an American design, Donald Vaccarino, Rio Grande games, two hands im Glück. And this is also something that has distributed itself kind of all over the world. And this is really 
what we have today. In our times, we are lucky enough to have cosmopolitan board games. They are invented here, published there, languages one, two, three, and um, they are adapted and revamped and republished. And we, I have games in my museum that I found in Italy because at Modena there are people from Chile who suddenly come and show their board games in, in a small town in Italy. You can find the Essen games from Taiwan and Russia and Singapore. And um, we have conventions like this wonderful Ropecon where you can play and get to know them. And thank you for letting me share my enjoyment in games and I hope you enjoy them too. Thank you. <laughs>